Towards the end of the great period of theatrical activity in London at the end of the 16th and start of the 17th century, one of the central figures is the actor-turned-manager Christopher Beeston. Christopher Beeston is one of the trendsetters in the Jacobean theatre. He's somebody we know had been a boy actor with the King's Men. He trained under Augustine Phillips, who's one of the casts of Shakespeare's plays, as mentioned in the first folio. But Beeston goes on to be much more notable as a manager than as an actor. He runs two theatres uh, for different clientels in slightly different parts of London. Um, he's flexible that way and very intelligent at tapping the biggest market he can. He has a place called The Red Bull in Clerkenwell, where he tends to put on adventure plays, and the Red Bull becomes notorious as a sort of rowdy, fun-loving, very pubbish theatre. He's also very important for moving the theatre much more into the West End, for pioneering uh, the indoor theatre. Well, I mean, he doesn't pioneer it, he follows the King's Men in this, because they've had the Blackfriars, this nice little hall playhouse, since 1608, and he gets hold of a cockpit on Drury Lane. You know, he's the first person to make Drury Lane into a theatrical uh, address. He buys a cockpit in 1616, where there are people you who know, setting chickens to, to kill each other, and gets it converted into a theatre. And it becomes his venue where he can charge higher admission prices, and because it's got a lid on it, he can run it all winter. So it's got a longer season, uh, smaller audience, but higher admission prices, and that seems to pay him pretty well. He's not necessarily a very nice person. Uh, we know quite a lot about his business dealings. He seems to have bribed the censor, Henry Herbert, uh, by giving him a share in one of his theatres and by buying expensive gloves for his wife to make sure that he stayed in favour with the authorities. And he also got charged with rape in 1602, which seems to have been the incident that resulted in him leaving the King's Men. But he's an important person. He's, he's got his finger in lots of pies uh, in the theatre business across London. In what would come to be called London's West End, Christopher Beeston's cockpit put on plays for elite audiences who enjoyed seeing on stage their pleasures and pastimes, including the gentlemanly sport of sword fighting. So there's... Good. So, uh, just, take, just take the position for the cut. So, so what we don't want to do is punch him in the face with the guard. So, it's, so if, you, if you keep it to about there and just... Just move it like that. That, that. In Beeston's time, in later Jacobean London, the whole social geography of the city is beginning to tip westwards. You've got a bigger court, you've got more people settling in what are becoming very fashionable neighbourhoods, and they still want entertainment, but they don't necessarily want to go to sleazy Southwark to get it. Uh, in Beeston's time, Covent Garden gets built. This incredible... Um, housing come retail development that's like nothing London's ever seen and it's all made of stone, it looks permanent, it looks Italianate, it's got clean lines, it's incredibly trendy. People who are settling there, who are you know, on the make, on the rise, associated with the court, they want a different kind of theatre and they're prepared to pay for it. And having the cockpit just around the corner from Covent Garden means he's there to tap that market. Everything we know about the site and everything we have from early drawings and plans of the district suggests that the cockpit probably didn't seat more than about 500 people at the most. So it's intimate, it's got artificial lighting, uh, and it's got a stage with people sitting around three sides of it and probably paying extra to sit on the stage and pose uh, as people did. The West End is close to the Inns of Court, so you've got rich law students, you've indeed got rich lawyers. I mean, there's a, a substantial growing legal population. There's a growing body of administrators who are actually associated with the court and hold court offices. And there are fashionable, upwardly mobile merchants who've, sp who've spilled out from the walls of the city and want to live you know, closer to the court, uh, closer to the legal business, uh, closer to the markets. Soon after it was opened, the cockpit was attacked and part demolished by a crowd of apprentices concerned that Beeston was moving one of his acting companies from the Red Bull to the much pricier cockpit. In the following years, the theatre was also known as the Phoenix because it had been reborn from the flames. One, two, 
Five. Yep. So your your movement is one, two, knocked away, four, six, one, two, three. Very good. 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 Very good. In general, the plays that are on at the cockpit contain a better class of character. They're not as necessarily bashors or Tamburlaine or sort of great thundering heroes, but in comedy they tend to be gentlemen, and some of it's set in London. Some of it is plays that depict exactly the kind of people who are sitting in the audience with you. So plays like Shirley's Hyde Park, plays like The Mulberry Garden, plays that are actually set in recognisable locations in London where merchants and citizens and courtiers are competing with each other and competing as to who's best dressed and who's most fashionable and so forth. So the sort of social experience of play going is very much reflected in what's happening on the stage, a kind of rivalry as to you know, what your status is and, and you know, whether you understand what's going on better than the people next to you, which is just what's happening to the characters. And in tragedy, Jacobi and tragedy, again, it's often about unsuccessful courtiers, disgruntled, disaffected, malcontented courtiers who are trying to get on in the world but can't, except you know, maybe by temporarily by prostituting their sisters and then they wind up having to murder several people and it's all rather terrible. But at least it's in a refined court atmosphere. You know, it's a better class of sarcasm and disaffection that you're seeing represented. One of the plays known by the late 1630s to have been in the repertory of Beeston's acting companies was A Fair Quarrel by Thomas Middleton and William Rowley, first printed in 1617. A Fair Quarrel by Middleton and Rowley is a terrific comedy which is very much about status uh, and class and codes of honour. Uh, there's a main plot in which a soldier is obsessed with his own honour and can't bear and can't rec can barely reconcile himself to existing, especially when he thinks his mother has done something wicked. Uh, and in the subplot, there's this brilliant Cornish idiot who's come to London and is trying to learn to be a successful braggart and duelist and, and sort of star of the bar room. Uh, and this competition for status. Uh, this competition as to who's got the right code and who's reading the social mores properly uh, is very much what drives the play forwards. And it suggests an audience who are themselves sort of on their mettle, who are themselves making judgments about uh, you know, who's eating their orange in the coolest way and who's come to London most recently. Death! How am I weighed? In an even balance, sir. A beard put in gives but a small advantage. Man and man, and lift the scales. Patience shall be my curse if it ride me further. How now, gallants? Beeston is very central to the theatre in the 1620s, 30s and very early 40s before it closes down because he's running both the survival of the Elizabethan theatre, both the stuff that hadn't changed at all, the audiences who still wanted to see Titus Andronicus and the Jew of Malta and Tamburlaine, and he's putting that stuff on for them at the Red Bull. So to some extent, the popular Elizabethan theatre didn't disappear just because Shakespeare died. It just carried on happening and, and, and often revived the same old plays. But at the same time, he's promoting new plays which are much closer in outlook to the court. Uh, he's working with playwrights who are half courtiers rather than people who've dropped out of university and fallen in among the players. But that overlap between, at the one end, the theatre and the court, and at the other end, the theatre and the pubs, you know, Beeston straddles it. All of that stuff is very much alive in the 20s and 30s. At the end of Beeston, what turns out to be the end of Beeston's career, Charles I declares personal rule, the court cuts itself off much more from Parliament, uh, court entertainments become much more of a minority event and rather beleaguered in their tone in the stuff that gets written for them. Um, the theatres get closed down, not so much because everybody suddenly decided that theatre was wicked, but simply because there was war on. The reason that's, a, that's the official reason the theatres are closed is simply that you know, there's a civil war, it's not appropriate for people to be you know, 
keeping their places of entertainment open and that you know you ought to be in the army or, or praying for deliverance uh, and when the when the uh, interregnum collapses you know it all springs up again I think one of the important things about Beeston in the long term is that when the theatre revives it's the indoor theatre that revives uh, and it's right round the corner from the cockpit you know, when Christopher Wren builds his great theatrical masterpiece, it's the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. It's, it's about 20 yards from where the cockpit stood. That theatre that's close to the court uh, is the one that we then get for the next two, three hundred years.